Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to this week's webinar uh, being given by Dr. Anna Chisholm. It's going to be on the topic of arterial blood gases, which is something that any medical professional could probably benefit from a little bit of, of, um, of teaching on. So without any further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Anna to, to take it away. Hi guys, welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. So before we get started, tonight's webinar is sponsored by MDU. Every doctor that works in the UK needs to have defence protection to practice and MDU are somebody that provide that. So you need to start thinking about that if you're a final year student going into F1 because you've um, indemnity that you have at the moment as a medical student won't automatically cover you into F1. So I'll show you just a quick video. They're perfect, I'll just put the um, presentation back on. So moving forward. So what is tonight's webinar going to be about? So firstly, we're going to talk about what arterial blood gases are and when to do them, and then move on to how to interpret them. And then some case presentations where you can try interpreting the ABGs yourselves at home and ask us any questions that you have. And we can give you a little bit of an explanation of the answers to them. I'm more than happy to have questions throughout if you just want to write them in the Facebook chat or alternatively we'll collect all the questions together and we'll try and answer them all at the end. But there'll be more, more than enough time to answer any questions or address any concerns that you might have. So what are arterial blood gases? Arterial samples of blood are blood samples that are taken from the arteries, like the name suggests, rather than from a vein. So when people normally say that they're taking some bloods, they normally mean that they're getting a venous sample rather than an arterial sample. However, arterial blood gases can be used to find more information out on a person's oxygen saturations. We're not going to cover how you actually take an ABG tonight, but we will provide a link in the chat now, just giving you a little bit of a run through on how to take them, because it's a bit of a tricky process. So normally the body tightly controls the bodily functions, the pH, the CO2, the HCO3. And it does that because for the body systems to work, they need to all be within a very narrow margin. However, stuff like organ dysfunction, so organ dysfunction of the lungs, of the heart, can disrupt the pH and that causes the bodily functions and the pH to not work as well. So in medical emergencies, often an ABG will be taken as it provides vital information very quickly and can help the team that are looking after the patient decide what to do and what management is needed. As junior doctors, I'm sure you'll take hundreds of these during your career. So let's move on on how to interpret them. So the normal values that the body works towards will always be down the right-hand side of your screen. So let's start. The first thing to look at is the PaO2. 
So a PaO2 of over 10 is normal in room air and healthy individuals that don't have any underlying conditions. Under 10 is known as hypoxemia and under eight is severe hypoxemia or respiratory failure. This value of over 10 is in room air in a normal individual. However, when people are unwell, they often require additional oxygen. And then if that is the case, the PaO2 should be 10 less than the oxygen that the person is being delivered. This will make a little bit more sense when we're switched to the next slide. So these are common oxygen delivery devices. And I'm sorry that second picture hasn't came up. I'm not sure why. So we've got nasal cannula, simple face masks, venturi masks, or a reservoir mask, non-rebreathe mask. And the amount of oxygen that can be delivered varies significantly depending on a patient's respiratory rate, the depth of the breath, and how well really the mask is fitting to their face. If there's a lot of gaps, there's a lot of oxygen that's being delivered just escaping to the atmosphere. The percentage of oxygen that each of these masks can potentially deliver, uh, given on the slide. So say somebody has a nasal cannula on of two litres, 28%, you therefore would expect their PaO2 to be 18, because that's 10 less than the 28. Venturi masks give an accurate delivery oxygen concentration and 24% or 28% are what are recommended in COPD. And the reservoir masks or the non rebreathe masks are what are used in medical emergencies. So we've looked at the PAO2 and we know if the patient's hypoxic or not, based whether they're on room air or whether they have a oxygen device in situ. We're then going to look at their PACO2. So if the patient, you know, has a low PAO2, you know the hypoxic, you've then got to look at their PACO2. And that'll decide if they're in type 1 respiratory failure or type 2 respiratory failure. Type 1 has low oxygen with normal CO2. Type 2 has low oxygen with high CO2. So type 1 respiratory failure is normally due to a ventilation perfusion mismatch or a VQ mismatch for short. And that means the volume of air that is entering the lungs is not equal to the volume of blood that is flowing to the lungs. So an example of that might be if ventilation is lower, but there's normal perfusion, that might be in things such as pulmonary edema or bronchoconstriction. Whereas if perfusion is low, so there might be like a blockage in the blood vessels, but there's normal ventilation, that would also cause type 1 respiratory failure, and that would be in something like a PE. Whereas type 2 respiratory failure is due to alveolar hypoventilation, and that might be due to airway obstruction and increased resistance in COPD. It might be due to decreased compliance of lung tissue in a rib fracture or a pneumonia. In motor neuron disease, it might be due to decreased strength of the muscle. Or in, if in someone who's taken a lot of opioids, there might just be decreased ventilation due to decreased respiratory drive. So we're going to look at the oxygen first. If the oxygen's low, we're then going to look at the PaCO2 to determine if it's type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure. Moving on, we're now going to look at the pH. So like I was saying before, small changes in the pH can have a big effect on the body and the physiological processes that go on. If the pH gets too high or too low, the body will start to shut down. The three different kinds of pH you can have is you can have your normal range where everything's working really well, the body's happy, everything's going good. If the pH is lower than 7.35, it's what's called acidotic. And if it's above 7.45, it's alkalotic. Changes or disruption in the pH are due to an imbalance of CO2 and HCO3. And that corresponds to a respiratory cause 
of a disturbance in the pH or a metabolic cause in the disturbance of the pH, with CO2 being the respiratory and HCO3 being the metabolic cause. So the first thing to do when you get given an ABG, after you've looked at the oxygen and the CO2 and decided if the person's in any respiratory failure, is to look at the pH. If it's normal, that's fantastic. If not, you need to decide, is it acidotic or alkalonic? The next thing you want to do is look back at the CO, C, PACO2, sorry. So you've already looked at it a little bit when you were looking at the respiratory, see if the patient was in respiratory failure or not, but you now want to look at it with, in correlation to the pH. So if your pH is abnormal, say it's acidotic or it's alkalotic, you then want to look at the PaCO2 and see if the PaCO2 correlates to the pH. If the CO, PaCO2 is absolutely normal, you can move on from this. So respiratory acidosis might be caused by COPD, asthma or drugs. And the cause there is when the body has too much carbon dioxide, it combines with water to produce H2CO3, which is carbonic acid, which is what causes the pH to become acidotic. Some causes of respiratory alkalosis are anxiety, hyperventilation, and in CNS trauma. And in that case, there's less CO2, so there's less water for it to combine with, so there's less carbonic acid. So we'll move on to HCO3 minus. So you've looked at the PaO2, you've looked at the PaCO2, and you've determined if the person's in respiratory failure or not. You've then looked at the pH and you've looked at the PaCO2 again to see if there is a respiratory cause of the patient's disturbance. If the PaCO2 is normal, you might want to move down to HCO3 to see if there's a metabolic cause of the patient's pH disturbance. And I apologize, this table hasn't came up on the screen and I'm sure you will copy of it in a little bit in a later bit. So if the HCO3 is normal, you can again move on. But then if it's not normal, you need to work out what's going on. So causes of metabolic acidosis may be sepsis, DKA, or metformin poisoning. Whereas causes of metabolic alkalosis might be vomiting, Cushing's disease, or even diuretics. To further investigate what is causing metabolic acidosis, you can work out that anion gap. And this allows you to determine the presence of unmeasured anions in the blood. So you do sodium plus potassium, take away chloride plus HCO3 minus, and the normal value is four to 12. If you've got a high anion gap, so above 12, that's due to increased acid production or ingestion so that would be in things such as DKA in diabetes or lactic acidosis. Whereas if you've got a lower anion gap, so less than four, that would be due to decreased acid secretion or loss of HCO3. And that would be things such as diarrhea, Addison's disease or renal tubular acidosis. You don't necessarily always have to do the anion gap. But if you're a little bit unsure what's going on, it can be a great way to just lower your differentials a little bit further and try and work out what's going on with the patient. So compensation. The body always wants to keep that equilibrium and wants to always stay within them pH values, the 7.35 to the 7.45, which is sort of the golden range where everything is working really well. So therefore, it tries to adapt and compensate in order to counteract what's going wrong. So if it's a respiratory problem, the metabolic system will try and compensate. If it's a metabolic problem, the respiratory system will try and compensate. So the metabolic system, in the nature of it, is quite slow to compensate. 
whereas the respiratory system is a lot, lot quicker. You can speed up your breathing a lot quicker than you can speed up your bodily processes. In people who have COPD, they constantly have a higher CO2 than people without COPD. And that's because they use that to drive their respiratory system. And therefore, they always have a little bit of metabolic compensation. So their HCO3 minus will always be a little bit above normal because that's just their way their body works to compensate having that increased CO2 all of the time. Just a quick word on base excess. This excess is another value that you get given on ABGs, and it's a bit of a surrogate for HCO3 minus. So high HCO3 minus correlates to high base excess, and a low HCO3 correlates to a low base excess. And they're just another thing that you can have a look at at the ABG to try and work out what's going on. There is a thing called mixed acidosis and alkalosis, which I know sounds very odd because I've just been telling you for quite a while that something is either acidotic or alkalotic. But there are a few conditions where there is a mixed picture. So mixed acidosis might be in something like a MI or multi-organ failure. If somebody's got renal failure, then they're going into respiratory failure, kid, um, liver failure all at once they might get a very mixed picture. And mixed alkalosis causes might be something caused like hyperemervous gravidum in people that are pregnant. So you can definitely get it. So now we'll just move on to some cases. I know we've discussed how to interpret an ABG, but it never is that you just get given an ABG in isolation. The ABGs always get given and always correspond to a patient case. So it's always best to find out a little bit more about the patient, find out what's going on with them, why they've been brought to hospital, what they've been taking, because this could really aid your interpretation of your ABG. So if you have a little read of the case, have a little read of the ABG, I give you a few minutes. And if you work through the different steps, so if you look at the PAO2, then the PACO2, find out if there's any respiratory problems, move on to look at the pH, then the PACO2, HCO3 and base excess, and see if you can work out what's going on. I'll just give you a few minutes to do that. Okay, perfect. So we'll try and work through it now. So reading the history, we've got quite a young lady who's presented to a &E unconscious. Little is known about her. 
On examination, there's multiple ulcers seen and she's got sweet smelling breath. So I'm already starting to get a few ideas what this could be, but we'll move on. So a PaO2 is 12, which is absolutely normal. So that's great. She's not in any respiratory failure or anything like that. So we'll move to the pH. The pH is low, so it's acidotic. So then we we'll want to look at the C. O2. And the CO2 is normal, maybe on the little bit lower side of normal, but it's still in the normal boundaries. So then we we'll want to move to the HCO3, which is 19, which is low. And then we can confirm that by looking at the base excess, which is minus four, which is also low. So from that, we've got a low pH, a low HCO3, and a low base excess. So we can formulate that this lady is in metabolic acidosis with no compensation from the CO2. So then we we'll start to think, what are the possible causes of metabolic acidosis and what could be going on with this lady? So the sepsis, which is one option. She does say that she has ulcers on, on our limbs. So it might be that them ulcers are infected and then she's got sepsis from that. And um, it could be that she's taken some medication and has some poisoning. The main one that causes metabolic acidosis is metformin. And there's no mention that she has type two diabetes or anything like that, but we don't know our drug history. However, the main thing that is leading me to think of um, DKA as the cause of this lady's metabolic acidosis, and DKA is diabetic ketoacidosis, is the fact that the lady's got this sweet smelling breath, which is the ketone breath that you often get in um, DKA. The lady also has these ulcers, which could correspond to type one diabetes that isn't that well controlled. So the answer for this one is metabolic acidosis due to diabetic ketoacidosis. So we'll move on. The next one is a gentleman, Mr. Smith. He's a little bit older, 80 year old, and he's been admitted to hospital unwell. He has a social history of working in the mines for many years. On examination, he's got the low body weight and yellow stain into his hands. His ABG is given below. So if again, if you work through it the same way you did before, you want to look at his PaO2, then his PaCO2. Then you want to look at the pH, see if there's any disturbance. Work through the PaCO2, HCO3 and the base excess and see if you can link it all together and find out what's going on. i give you a few minutes for that. So we're getting lots of answers coming through suggesting compensated met, uh, respiratory acidosis. Sorry, okay. acidosis. There, there's, there's a couple of both. There's a bit of a debate in the comments. Okay, fine. Let's we can go through it. So this gentleman's a little bit older. That's the first thing to note, and he's unwell. He has the social history of being in the mines. So the first thing I'm thinking there is, has he got some respiratory condition going on? He's then got the low body weight. 
and a yellow staining to his hands. So the yellow staining is made us think that is he a smoker, is a tar staining, something like that. So we'll go on to look at his ABG. So his PO2 is 18 and that's on four liters. So four liters you would normally get an ideal oxygen saturation of 36%. So 36 take away the 10 would be 26. So it might be that this gentleman is undersaturated a little bit, but he might be a gentleman who sat run a little bit lower because he is a CO2 retainer. So then we're going to look at the pH. pH is slightly acidotic, but it's, it's very close to being normal. So then we'll look at the CO2, which is a little bit high. And then we'll come down to the HCO3, which is again a little bit high. And the basic base excess agrees with that. So yes, it could be that this gentleman has respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation. And what is leading us to think that there is something going on is that this gentleman is requiring the oxygen and that he has come in unwell. It might be that this, these figures are very similar to his baseline, considering that it sounds like he has an underlying diagnosis of some respiratory conditions. But the fact that is he is unwell is leading us to think that he is off he is unwell and needs some support. Is that all right? Is there any questions with regards to that? Or we'll move on to the next one. There's just one question that's come yeah, to asking if um, um if it's not if, if if the pH isn't within normal range, then can we say um, that this is a fully compensated acidosis? No, so you can't say it's fully compensated. That's exactly right. You would say that it was partially. That's, that's all the questions at the, at the present. Perfect. So we'll just move on to the last case. So the last case is a young gentleman who's again being admitted with shortness of breath. No past medical history of note, normally very fit and well. On examination, he's very tall in stature with long limbs. So his ABG is as follows. So if you start again by looking at the O2, then looking at the CO2, seeing if there's any respiratory failure, see what's going on. Then look at his pH, his CO2 and his HCO3 and see if you can piece together what's going on. Give you a minute or so. So there seems to be a bit of a consensus in the comments suggesting mm -hmm. acute respiratory alkalosis with no mm -hmm. compensation. Yeah, okay, so let's work through it. So he's a young gentleman, shortness of breath. He's got tall stature and long limbs, not really giving us a lot of information there. Might be significant, we're not sure yet. So yeah, that's exactly right. His P well, if we start with his PAO2, it's 32 on four liters. So normally on four liters, Again, you would be 36%, take 10 away, you'd be aiming for about 26%. So it might be that this gentleman is actually being oversaturated. We might try to turn his oxygen down a little bit. He might be better on three liters, might be managed on two liters. So 
then we'll want to look at his C, his pH, 7.48. So this gentleman is alcoholic, like he's the same. His CO2 is down and his HCO3 is bang, bang in the middle really. And his base excess is absolutely normal. So yes, that's exactly right, respiratory alkalosis. And what I was going for with this case presentation was that just gentlemen um, could have something like Marfan's disease. And the Marfan's disease is caused something like a pneumothorax and that's why he's got his respiratory alkalosis. Bit of a hard one to put together, but that's where I was going with that one. So that's the end of the case presentations. So more than happy to answer any questions anybody has or have any comments has anybody had anybody taken any abgs themselves that they found quite tricky has anybody seen any extremes on abgs that they'd like to tell us about anything like that so there's been one question that's come through from yeah. carolina asking if you could just go over the um you know calculating what pao2 you'd expect yeah no um, when 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 they're on some sort of oxygen therapy just just figuring out how much PO2 you'd expect to be on on the blood gas yep so i'll just go back to that slide so on a normal individual who hasn't got any respiratory dysfunction and is just breathing room air you'd expect their PO2 to be over 10 and if it's under 10 that's when there's a problem but then some people need help with maintaining their oxygen saturations. So they might get put on one of these devices. So it might be a nasal cannula, a face mask, or a venturi. And if you get given one of these, we're obviously increasing the amount of oxygen that the person's being given, and you're giving them a high amount of oxygen that's just in normal room air. So then when you're doing the calculation, you'd expect their PAO2 to be, 10, to be 10 less than what they're being given. So if somebody is having a nasal cannula in place, which is at a rate of four liters, their suggested amount of oxygen they're gonna be getting is 36%. And therefore you'd expect their PAO2 on an ABG to be 26. If it was higher than 26, they're getting over oxygenated. If it's below 26, they're not getting enough oxygen. Obviously 36 is like the suggested what the person using that device should get, but it depends on the person's respiratory rate, how tight the mask is and how big the breaths that are the person's taking. Thanks Anna. No, I think that was a really good explanation actually. Um, there's another question, mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the last case, why mm -hmm. wh a lot of people actually got that it was more fans, which was really good. Um, someone oh, just perfect. asking, yeah, yeah. Someone just asking why more fans would result in that. So more fans is a connective tissue disease. And the way I think about it is that people with more fans just have extra stretchy skin. So Marfans and Erlestanis, they just have extra sketchy skin with extra long arms, they're very tall. And because of that, they're just prone to have spontaneous pneumothoraxes. So it might be that they just take too big a deep breath or that they're coughing and that the layers of their lungs just come apart. They're not as stable because they're overly stretched and that's what causes them to have a pneumothorax. Not by any means saying that everybody with Marfan's disease will have a pneumothorax. It's just the more likely in that disease. And I thought it might be a nice link for the case. Yeah, no, perfect. I think that's a really good way to remember it, actually. Stretch your limbs and making it more risk, uh, making them more at risk. There's another question, um, Anna. Um, does hyperventilation lead to uh, respiratory alkalosis? Yes. Yeah. So if oh. you're hyperventilating, your body's not working. The body's can't. It's not. 
<laughs> it's hard to explain, but if you're hyperventilating, you're not, there isn't as much CO2 in your blood because you're like breathing so quickly and that causes, there's less CO2 to combine with the water and that causes you to become alkalotic. And that's because you're just breathing so quickly. Yeah, no, exactly. It, it, it's the case that you're breathing so quickly that you're getting rid of a lot of carbon mm -hmm. dioxide. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, another question. I mean, I'm not sure if you if you know quite the uh, numbers and things here, but one was why do you take 10 away from um, the the amount of litres? Yeah. Uh, being given to calculate the PaO2 mm -hmm. value. I apologize, I don't know. And um, that's just a figure that all sort of medical professionals seem to use, whether in a &E or on the wards or anywhere. It's just sort of a ballpark figure that people use. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. And um, Anna, when would you do a VBG rather than an ABG? Mm -hmm. So if you were worried that somebody was unwell but you weren't necessarily thinking that it was a respiratory cause you might want to take a vbg because you still get all the information on it with regards to lactate electrolyte um values but you just don't get the values with regards o2 so you still would get a hco3 on your vbg so if you're worried about a person that's unwell, but you don't think it's necessarily respiratory, the maintaining the SAT on the OBS machine, the SATs are quite high over sort of 94 to 98 or 88 to 92 in COPD, and you think it's not really something respiratory, then you might just want to get a VBG to see what's going on. In addition, um, VBGs can be done while taking in other bloods so if you're taking a full blood count or using ease a coag anyway you might want to take a vbg because you get the results a lot quicker than you do the other blood tests so that can give you a quick indication of what's going on and try and start your management off from there but if there was any concern with regards respiratory distress or dis respiratory failure anything like that you'd want to get an abg yeah, no, um, exactly. I think that's right. And the other thing, would you say, Anna, that when you're worried about the oxygenation, you don't want an ABG because it's the arterial blood that's leaving the heart and hasn't quite been used by the organs yet. Whereas if you get a VBG, which is from the venous blood, the oxygenation will be a lot lower because that, that blood's been used by the organs now. Yes, that's exactly right. You wouldn't be able to interpret a PAO2 from a venous blood gas. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think one other thing, Anna, um, I don't know if you'd agree, but uh, VBG and ABG, they're both really good for pH. And mm -hmm. I mean, I was reading something the other day and one of the consultants had told me that um, the pH difference between VBGs and ABGs is actually only about 0.05. And yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. what you yeah think that's exactly that? right. Hmm. It's a very similar. Yeah. Um, someone's mentioned, can you talk a little bit about lactate? Would you, have you got any key points about lactate, Anna? Um, so lactate is the value you can get on a VBG or you can get it on an ABG. You can also just send a blood bottle off for lactate itself if you wanted to do that. And um, lactate is quite non-specific, but it can be an indication that something is going wrong. So if somebody has a high lactate, you know that um, there's something going wrong in the body or something has just gone wrong. So it might be that there's been cell death, the person's just had a seizure. So lactate can be a good measurement to either reassure you or concern you. So if you get someone's lactate and it's quite low and you can be quite happy that this patient's sort of okay, is a little bit more stable, Whereas if you take get a lactate value that's high, so I think the number is over two, if you get someone's um, value that is higher than two, that's when you need to start worrying what's going on. Is it something intra-abdominally that's going on? 
has the person had like a cardiac event? Is there something like a PE? Anything like that can raise your lactate. So it is great, but just quite non-specific. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And um, another question: Can you explain the idea of base excess and when you would look at that? When that me yeah. that might be clinically useful. Yeah. So base excess for all intentional purposes is just the surrogate for HCO3. And some people just look at base excess instead of looking at HCO3. I know when I first started learning about ABGs, we got taught to look at base excess instead of the um, HCO3 minus. But I know I just find it easier to look at the HCO3, but it's honestly very up to you which one you want to look at. I sometimes think that base excess, I don't know if this is definitely right, doesn't, because um, the values are a smaller range, it doesn't move as much. So for somebody, somebody who is in metabolic acidosis, the base excess value might not have changed as much as the HCO3 minus has. Does that make sense? That, that makes sense yeah, yeah well, that makes sense to me if any if anything not clear then they can uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll pop it on the um, comments anyway um anything else um not not really i mean someone's mm -hmm. asked um an a pao2 of 26 on an abg would that be classed as over oxygenation um yeah, of 20 PAO2 of 26 and eight. But I think it would depend on the situation. Um, mm -hmm. it, is the person on oxygen? Or they're I mean, just on room air? I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there must be. A, yeah. yeah. I, I, it, so like I think so. it would be quite yeah. high if they were just on room air. But then 26, it would just depend what device they were using, really. Mm -hmm. yeah no i would agree sorry if they want to give us more information i'm more than happy to help them a little bit further but no no i th i think that's perfectly um right it depends on the oxygenation that they're that they're on i think i think that's about that um anna uh thank you so much that was really really okay. useful uh, okay. lecture um, guys, if you would like to give us any feedback, that would be absolutely fantastic. You can just scan the QR code or use the link. That'd be great. Thank you. And please get in touch if there's any more questions. We can try and answer them as best we can.